horizon stretched vast and infinite as Jacob Bennett gazed out from the bow of the SS Odyssey, the sun's last rays shimmering on the water's surface. North Shore, Oahu, with its infamous reputation for breathtaking beauty and lurking danger, had become a significant chapter in his life, one written in pain and loss. Here, where the sky kissed the ocean, Jacob had lost more than friends. He'd lost parts of himself to the depths, parts swallowed by the dark shadows beneath the waves. Years had passed since that fateful day when the sea turned from friend to foe, claiming the lives of his crew in a brutal shark attack while sparing him. The guilt of surviving when others did not haunt him daily was an ever-present specter in his solitary life as a seasoned sailor. Yet here he was, back at the very place that had sculpted his destiny. Not to relive his nightmares, but to confront them head-on. Joining him on this journey was a new crew, an eclectic mix of individuals drawn to the sea for different reasons. Among them were Alice Martinez, a marine biologist determined to study shark behaviors in their natural habitat, and Mike Reynolds, a daring filmmaker eager to capture the raw and untamed essence of one of the world's most dangerous waters. Together with a few other seasoned sailors and enthusiastic researchers, they aimed to create a documentary that would demystify the predators of the deep and perhaps close a painful chapter in Jacob's Book of Life. The SS Odyssey was a sturdy vessel equipped with the latest technology in marine exploration and safety. Cameras and sensors lined every part of the ship, ready to document and react to any sign of shark activity. As they ventured deeper into the heart of the shark territory, the crew's excitement was palpable, mixed with an undercurrent of tension. Jacob watched the operations with a practiced eye as both guide and guardian. His experiences had taught him the subtle language of the sea, how the color of the water could change with the presence of predators, how the silence of the waves could herald impending danger. He was their sentinel, their bridge over turbulent waters. On the third day, as the sun climbed high into the sky, the Odyssey encountered its first significant test. A group of sharks, attracted by the experimental bait the crew had deployed, began to display unusually aggressive behaviors. Jacob's heart raced as he recognized the signs of a potential feeding frenzy. It was a dangerous situation that could spiral out of control if not handled precisely and calmly. Under Jacob's command, the crew worked swiftly. Alice monitored the shark's movements from her station, providing Jacob real-time updates. At the same time, Mike captured every tense moment behind his camera, his lens never wavering from the action. Sensing the disturbance, the sharks increased their activity, circling closer to the Odyssey. Jacob's instincts kicked in, and he ordered the deployment of a new, non-lethal deterrent, a specialized acoustic device designed to disorient the sharks without causing them harm. The effect was instantaneous. The sharks, momentarily confused, ceased their advance, giving the crew a brief respite. As the sea calmed, Jacob knew this was only the beginning. The actual test of their resolve and his leadership was yet to come. The atmosphere aboard the SS Odyssey remained charged with nervous energy, the unpredictable sea reaffirming its dangers. Jacob stood resolute at the helm, adrenaline and deep-seated fear stirring within him. There was no time for reflection. They were in the heart of shark territory, and survival was all that mattered. As night fell, the crew hoped for a quiet evening. The Odyssey's lights cast a peaceful glow over the water. Alice and Mike reviewed the day's footage of the majestic yet terrifying sharks, knowing their work could change perceptions. However, the tranquility was short-lived. An alarm pierced the night. The sharks were back, more aggressive. Jacob urgently ordered the crew to shut off all lights and halt movements. The Odyssey became a silent, dark ghost ship in the vast ocean. The change in tactics initially worked. The sharks, confused by the sudden darkness and silence, slowed their approach. However, a massive, great white shark emerged, circling the Odyssey with cold, primal intelligence. Jacob decided to risk using a deep-sea flare designed to mimic prey and draw the sharks away. The flare ignited a bright glow, mesmerizing the sharks, who followed it into the depths. The crew sighed in relief as the predators disappeared tension easing from their shoulders. In the quiet that followed, Jacob stood alone on the deck, looking out over the water. The ghosts of his past would never entirely leave him, but tonight, he had faced them head on. He had not only protected his crew, 
but had also given the sharks the respect and space they deserved. It was a delicate balance he had learned the hard way. As dawn broke over the horizon, the SS Odyssey turned towards home. The crew, exhausted yet exhilarated, had survived the night. For Jacob, the journey back wasn't just a return to safety. It was a step towards healing the deep scars of his past. His survival guilt might never disappear altogether, but now he knew that his experiences, however painful, had a purpose. They had taught him to navigate the waters and the storms within. Night sky was a velvet canvas with stars, and the lavish yacht party was in full swing. On board an exquisite yacht was an elite crowd of socialites, business magnates, and celebrities. The gentle lapping of the waves against the hull starkly contrasted with the laughter and music emanating from the deck. The party had been meticulously planned by its host, Victor Carmichael, a wealthy entrepreneur known for his extravagant taste. Guests mingled on the deck sipping champagne and enjoying gourmet hors d'oeuvres. The yacht was adorned with elegant decorations, and a live band played a mix of jazz and contemporary hits. The atmosphere was electric, a perfect blend of luxury and leisure. As the night wore on, the alcohol flowed freely, and some guests, feeling adventurous, decided to take a late-night swim. Among them was Derek Lawson, a young tech mogul who had quickly risen to fame and fortune. Derek, always the life of the party, stripped down to his swim trunks and dove into the dark, inviting waters. Several others followed suit, their laughter echoing across the water. A few minutes later, a scream pierced the night. It was Derek thrashing in the water. Panic spread like wildfire among the guests as they realized something was wrong. The spotlights from the yacht illuminated the scene, and what they saw made their blood run cold. Sharks circled Derek, their dorsal fins cutting through the water with menacing precision. Although everyone could clearly see them, they stood at a standstill until one of them screamed and chaos ensued. The crew, trained for emergencies but not expecting such a scenario, sprang into action. The captain, also in charge of the yacht's technical aspects, quickly acted. He grabbed a life preserver and threw it toward Derek, but the sharks were closing in fast. Victor, the host, also had something to say as he yelled at Derek to grab something. The crew scrambled, and a thick rope was tossed into the water within moments. Derek, eyes wide with terror, managed to grab hold of it. The guests and crew pulled with all their might, hauling him towards the yacht. As they did, the sharks became more aggressive, sensing an easy meal. Just as they were about to pull Derek aboard, a loud bang reverberated through the yacht. The engine had failed. The lights flickered and then everything went dark. The yacht was dead in the water, and the sense of helplessness was palpable. But while they were in horror about that and needed to calm down, another scream from Derek jolted them back. From there, they knew they had to get Derek out of the water first because the shark had launched another attack at his thigh. The crew and guests worked together, pulling Derek up the side of the yacht. Just as his feet left the water, the shark lunged again, but its teeth only snapped shut inches from his legs. They managed to pull him aboard, but Derek was in shock, shivering uncontrollably. Victor urged the captain to get the engine running, suggesting they check the engine room for flooding, and decided to accompany him while instructing the rest of the crew to stay alert and monitor the water. As Victor and the captain made their way to the engine room, the rest of the crew and guests huddled together on the deck, the weight of their situation sinking in. They were stranded, surrounded by sharks, with no way to call for help. The radio had gone dead with the power outage, and their cell phones had no signal this far out at sea. The situation in the engine room was dire. The captain opened a hatch to reveal seawater flooding the compartment. Grabbing a manual bilge pump, Victor joined the captain, and they worked tirelessly to pump water out of the engine room, their muscles straining with the effort. On deck, the tension was palpable. Every splash or ripple in the water sent shivers down their spines. The crew kept a close watch, ready to defend against any sharks that got too close. They armed themselves with whatever they could find. Oars deck chairs, even bottles. Wrapped in a blanket, Derek sat trembling, muttering that he won't be able to make it alive. He had sustained a wound, and with no first aid equipment available, they used torn clothes as a makeshift tourniquet. But it wasn't enough to stop the bleeding. 
As the minutes turned into hours, the captain and Victor finally managed to pump out enough water to access the engine. He checked it and let Victor know they needed some tools. Victor, not one to give up easily, asked for what was missing so they could improvise. They rummaged through the yacht's storage, gathering tools and equipment. Meanwhile, those on the deck have resorted to using the yacht's emergency flares to try and signal any nearby ships. They took turns firing flares into the night sky, their bright light briefly illuminating the sea before fading into the darkness. An hour passed, and the mood grew increasingly desperate. When hope seemed to disappear, one of the flares illuminated a distant shape. Another yacht was approaching, drawn by the flares. Cheers erupted from the deck as the vessel drew nearer. As the rescue yacht approached, it became clear they were still far away. Victor knew they couldn't afford to wait passively. They needed to make their yacht visible and reachable. He directed the crew to gather any materials that could serve as torches. The guests also contributed by creating makeshift lights from clothing and flammable liquids. Standing at the edge of the deck, Victor waved a torch high above his head. Seeing the signal, the approaching yacht altered its course to head directly towards them. As it drew closer, the captain of the rescue vessel shouted through a megaphone, instructing them to prepare for a tow. The rescue ship, a sturdy craft equipped for emergencies, skillfully maneuvered alongside the yacht. Ropes were thrown, and the crew quickly secured the vessels together. With a collective effort, they began to tow the stranded yacht toward safety. Back on land, the ordeal was far from over. Derek was taken to the hospital for treatment and observation, his ordeal in the water having taken a significant toll on him. The other guests, while physically unscathed, were visibly shaken. News of the incident spread quickly, drawing media attention and concern from those who had not attended the party. Victor addressed the media. He praised the bravery and teamwork of everyone involved, from the crew to the guests, and expressed his gratitude to the rescue ship that had come to their aid. He vowed to investigate the engine failure and ensure such an incident would never happen again. In the weeks that followed, the yacht underwent extensive repairs and upgrades. Victor spared no expense in ensuring the yacht was equipped with the latest safety features and backup systems. He also implemented new emergency protocols, determined to prevent future crises. In 2009, a group of passionate environmental activists from the renowned organization Ocean Guardians embarked on a daring mission to expose the illegal fishing practices plaguing the protected waters of the Phoenix Islands, a remote archipelago in the heart of the Southern Pacific Ocean. Led by the fearless Anahera Morehu and her dedicated colleagues Tomoko Nakamura and Javier Espinoza, they set sail from their base in Samoa, determined to gather irrefutable evidence of the rampant exploitation that threatened the delicate marine ecosystem. The Phoenix Islands, a breathtaking chain of coral atolls and submerged reefs, have been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a strictly enforced marine protected area. However, recent reports from local fishermen and scientists indicate an alarming rise in illegal fishing vessels many of which employ destructive practices such as bottom trawling and blast fishing. As the team's rugged research vessel, the Kaimana, cut through the turquoise waters, Anna Hera briefed her crew on the mission's objectives. They would conduct covert surveillance operations, utilizing state-of-the-art underwater drones and camera equipment to document illegal fishing activities. They would focus on the remote and uninhabited atolls where such operations were most likely to occur. Tomoko, a skilled marine biologist, and Javier, a former Navy diver, would deploy the underwater drones and gather crucial footage. Anna Hera, assisted by their seasoned first mate, Tama Viliamu, would coordinate the operation from the Kaimana's bridge. The first few days of their expedition yielded little evidence of illegal activities. Still, as they ventured deeper into the isolated reaches of the archipelago, the team began encountering disturbing signs of environmental destruction. Discarded fishing nets and lines littered the once pristine coral reefs, trapping and suffocating countless marine creatures. The waters were clouded with sediment, a telltale sign of bottom trawling. A practice indiscriminately scraped the seafloor, decimating entire ecosystems. While investigating one such trawling site, the team made a chilling discovery. Tomoko and Javier piloted their underwater drone through the murky depths 
they encountered a gruesome scene, a vast array of mutilated fish carcasses and discarded remains, seemingly cast aside by the illegal fishing vessels as worthless bycatch. Little did they know that this gruesome display had attracted the attention of a deadly visitor, a massive bull shark lured by the scent of blood and the promise of an easy meal. As the drone's cameras captured the shark's ominous silhouette gliding through the debris field, a sense of dread washed over the team. Undeterred, they continued their mission, but the shark's presence grew increasingly bold and aggressive. During one harrowing encounter, the predator charged at Tomoko and Javier's dive team, forcing them to retreat hastily to the safety of the Kaimana. It soon became apparent that the shark had been driven into a frenzy by the constant influx of discarded fish remains, and its natural hunting instincts had heightened to a dangerous degree. With their movements now restricted by the threat of attack, the team found themselves in a precarious position, and their ability to gather evidence was severely compromised. In a daring gambit, Anahira proposed a risky plan. They would use their knowledge of the marine environment to lure the shark away from the hotspots of illegal fishing activity, allowing them to continue their documentation efforts unimpeded. Utilizing a specialized bait cage loaded with chum, they began a carefully orchestrated campaign to draw the shark towards a remote and isolated atoll, far from the areas they needed to investigate. Slowly but surely, the strategy appeared to work as the massive predator followed the tantalizing trail of scents, its bloodlust overriding its natural wariness. However, disaster struck when a sudden storm swept through the area tossing the kaimana like a toy and snapping the reinforced line securing the bait cage. The cage plunged into the depths in a heart-stopping moment, taking the team's only means of luring the shark with it. Stranded and with their resources dwindling, the Ocean Guardians found themselves in a desperate struggle for survival. Now fully aroused and sensing easy prey, the shark began to circle the kaimana with increasing boldness, its massive bulk cutting through the waves like a torpedo. In a last-ditch effort, Anahara and her team devised a daring plan to repel the shark using a combination of underwater flares and a high-frequency acoustic deterrent system. A tense silence fell over the vessel as Tomoko and Javier suited up again, preparing to deploy the deterrents. With a thunderous splash, the shark breached the surface, its gaping maw and rows of serrated teeth terrifying. Undaunted, Tomoko and Javier executed their plan precisely detonating the flares and activating the acoustic system in a blinding display of light and sound. It seemed their gambit had failed for a moment, but miraculously, the shark veered off course, disoriented and confused by the overwhelming sensory onslaught. Seizing their opportunity, the team swiftly retrieved their colleagues and retreated from the atoll, their hearts pounding with relief and exhilaration. In the following weeks, the Ocean Guardian's daring mission yielded a treasure trove of evidence, including stunning footage of illegal fishing vessels in action and heartbreaking scenes of environmental devastation. Armed with this irrefutable proof, they launched a global awareness campaign, partnering with governments and international organizations to crack down on the lawless exploitation of the Phoenix Island's fragile marine ecosystem. Their efforts paid off handsomely, with several primary fishing operations being shuttered and severe penalties imposed on those found guilty of illegal activities. Moreover, their harrowing encounter with the bull shark served as a sobering reminder of the delicate balance within the ocean's depths and the profound impact human actions could have on even the most fearsome predators. The Phoenix Islands mission was a defining moment, a testament to the power of courage, perseverance, and unwavering commitment to protecting the natural world. As they looked towards the future, they knew their work was far from over. Still, they were bolstered by the knowledge that those who fought for the planet's preservation could emerge victorious, despite seemingly insurmountable odds. It was a crisp autumn morning in 2011 when Zosha Kamuri, one of the most experienced cave rescue divers in the Florida Keys, received an emergency call that would test the limits of her bravery and skills. A lone spear fisherman, Handan Khalil, had failed to resurface from the treacherous underwater cave system in the marine sanctuary waters off the coast of Key Largo in the upper Florida Keys. Zosha and her team quickly gathered their specialized gear and sped to the remote cave. 
The cave entrance opened beneath the surface, requiring a complex staged decompression descent through the narrow lava tube. Visibility was poor, as the cave's waters were thick with planktonic blooms, and silt kicked up from previous diving activity. As Zosha made her way deeper into the lightless labyrinth, she picked up Handon's faint distress signals on her locator equipment. The fisherman had become entangled in his line amid a dense thicket of ancient stalactites and stalagmites in one of the cave's innermost chambers. She could hear his panicked breathing over the communications link as his air supply dwindled critically low. Zosha increased her pace, pulling herself hand over hand along the guideline, her high-powered lamps cutting through the inky void. That's when she saw a massive creature drifting through the shadows ahead. It was quickly 15 feet long and decidedly not the docile reef sharks occasionally spotted within the area. The unmistakable silhouette, elongated snout, and distinct dorsal fin told her it was an adult great white shark. White sharks were scarce in these waters, and Zosha's blood went cold when she realized this alpha predator may have taken up residence inside the cave system with a trapped human providing the perfect lure. She signaled Handon to cease all movement and went breathlessly still, watching the great whites every twitch. The shark seemed to sense her presence, languidly approaching with methodical precision, its obsidian eyes piercing her. Zosha reached for her shark billy stick, a defensive weapon to drive off an attack if needed. A cloud of silt billowed up as something shifted behind the great white, briefly obscuring its position. Zosha's heart leaped into her throat when it cleared. Two more sharks had joined the first, swimming in tandem. She was surrounded by a pack of aggressive hunters closing in on her and their prey. Her safety training urged her to abandon the rescue attempt in the face of such extreme peril. But with Handon's fading life signs still registering, her determination kicked in. Shoving her fear aside, Zosha pushed forward towards the entangled fisherman. She had inches to spare as the trio of great whites began circling tighter, swimming figure eights around them. Their pointed snouts and rows of serrated teeth emerged from the gloom, almost close enough to graze her suit. Finally reaching Handon's position, Zosha rapidly untangled the fishing line from the stalagmites and secured him to her safety leash. His tank was nearly depleted from struggling in a futile panic. As the menacing shapes of the great whites drew closer, Zosha decided to activate the emergency heat marker. The searing flash momentarily disoriented the sharks, causing them to flinch and retreat, buying her a precious head start. Not wasting her narrow window of opportunity, Zosha kicked into high gear, using her powerful fins to propel herself and hand and back down the guideline towards the exit as swiftly as possible. The Great Whites gave furious pursuit, jaws gaping hungrily mere feet behind. She armed her shark billy and prepared for a confrontation. But as they approached the final bottleneck entrance to the caves, the sharks inexplicably broke off their attack, vanishing back into the blackness from which they came. Zosha didn't wait to discover their motivation, continuing and bursting through the surface into the open ocean. Gasping for air, she looked down at Handon, who was already beginning to regain consciousness. Though shaken to her core, Zosha had conquered one of the most extreme tests of her diving career through her bravery, skill, and unwavering commitment to the rescue ethos trading one life for another no matter what monsters may lurk in the darkness. The year was 2007, and it was a picture-perfect summer day in the coastal town of Newport, Rhode Island, where the prestigious Brenton Cove Yacht Club hosted its annual sailing regatta. The event, a time-honored tradition among the city's elite, drew spectators and participants from across the country eager to showcase their skills on the open waters of Narragansett Bay. Among the competitors was Soren Beaumont, a dashing and accomplished sailor whose family had been members of the Brenton Cove Yacht Club for generations. Soren's sleek sloop, the Zephyr, was a marvel of nautical engineering, its gleaming hull and billowing sails a testament to his meticulous attention to detail. A flotilla of spectator boats trailed behind the competitors as the race commenced. Their decks were filled with the town's most affluent residents, sipping champagne and cheering on their favored sailors. Among the onlookers were Valeska Wakefield, the club's esteemed Commodore, and her husband Damien, a prominent businessman with a passion for sailing. The first few hours of the race unfolded without incident, 
the graceful yachts carving through the gentle swells as their skilled crews tacked and jibed in pursuit of the coveted trophy. However, the winds shifted as the day wore on, and a palpable sense of unease settled over the bay. It was during one of these sudden wind shifts that disaster struck. Soren's Zephyr, caught off balance by the erratic gusts, heeled violently to one side, sending him tumbling overboard and into the churning waters. For a brief moment, stunned silence fell over the spectator fleet as they watched the scene unfold. But Valeska first sprang into action, demanding her crew to prepare a rescue launch and signal the race committee for assistance. As the rescue boat drew nearer to Soren's location, a chilling sight emerged from the depths, a massive dorsal fin cutting through the waves like a knife. In that heart-stopping moment, the spectators realized they were facing a threat far more terrifying than a simple man-overboard situation. A great white shark had been drawn to the area, its predatory instincts piqued by the commotion. Soren, treading water and struggling to stay afloat, caught sight of the ominous fin and felt a surge of adrenaline coursing through his veins. With every ounce of his remaining strength, he began swimming towards the nearest spectator boat his limbs propelling him through the choppy waters with desperate urgency. But the shark, sensing its prey, gave chase, its massive bulk cutting through the water with terrifying speed. As the spectators watched in horror, the great white lunged toward Soren, its gaping jaws snapping shut mere inches from his flailing limbs. In a split-second decision, a former naval officer, Damian Wakefield, seized control of the situation. Barking orders to the crew, he directed them to begin pelting the shark with flares and emergency signal devices, hoping to distract the predator and buy Soren precious seconds to reach safety. Soren was hauled aboard a nearby spectator yacht, his body trembling with fear and exhaustion. But the respite was short-lived. The enraged shark, its territorial instincts fully aroused, began targeting the cluster of boats, its massive jaws snapping at the hulls and sending shockwaves through the water. Valeska Wakefield took charge as the chaos unfolded, her authoritative voice cutting through the panic like a clarion call. With swift precision, she coordinated the various crews, organizing a defensive perimeter around the stricken Zephyr and directing the fleet to begin a slow but steady retreat toward the safety of the harbor. Time and again, the Great White would surge towards the boats, its massive bulk causing the vessels to rock precariously in the water. But the combined efforts of the crews, armed with flares, horns, and makeshift deterrents, kept the Predator at bay, allowing the fleet to inch ever closer to the sanctuary of the harbor. Later, the battered and weary group reached the safety of the Brenton Cove Yacht Club's docks. Soren, still shaken by his harrowing ordeal, was immediately whisked away to receive medical attention, while the spectators and crews gathered to recount the day's harrowing events. The attack became the subject of intense scrutiny and debate, with experts weighing in on the factors that may have drawn the Great Whites to the area. Some speculated that the commotion of the race, coupled with the presence of discarded bait and chum, had inadvertently attracted the shark's attention. For the members of the Brenton Cove Yacht Club, the incident served as a sobering reminder of the delicate balance between humanity and the natural world. While their passion for sailing remained undiminished, a newfound respect for nature's power and unpredictability had taken root. Soren Beaumont, his brush with death etched into his memory, found solace in the unwavering support of his fellow sailors and the resilience of the human spirit. And though the scars of his encounter would linger, both physical and emotional, he knew that the bonds forged in the face of adversity would endure long after the memory of the Great White's terrifying visage had faded. 2009, a private charter plane flying over the remote Cook Islands in the South Pacific encountered severe turbulence and storms as it traversed the vast open waters between French Polynesia and Samoa. On board were Zethrid Melek, a wealthy businessman, his wife Jyotika and their teenage son Chakor, Marvik Siraj, Zethrid's assistant, Inaya Devi, a family friend, and Elian Cruz, the pilot. Despite Elian's efforts, the plane lost altitude rapidly and crashed into the open ocean. After inflating a life raft and rowing to shore, the six survivors were stranded on a remote, uninhabited island. With limited supplies salvaged from the wreckage, they quickly realized the dire nature of their situation. 
Food and fresh water were scarce, and they had no means of signaling for rescue. Zethrid determined their best hope was to fish from the island's shoreline, using makeshift equipment crafted from the plane's debris. However, their efforts soon attracted an unwanted visitor, a massive bull shark stalking the shallows. On their fourth fishing attempt, Geotica felt a powerful tug on her line as the considerable shark struck, nearly pulling her into the bloody turmoil before the line snapped. The group scattered back from the water's edge, shaken by the close call but undeterred in their need for sustenance. They cautiously resumed fishing over the next few days while one person stood sentry to fend off further attacks. The bull shark grew increasingly aggressive, recognizing their activities as a food source. When it struck again, this time going after Chakor, Elian and Marvik had to intervene to prevent the teen from being pulled into the shark's gaping maw. Realizing that their fishing expeditions were too hazardous to continue, the castaways had to find another means of survival. As they were coping with dehydration beneath the scorching sun, Inaya proposed an ingenious solution, using plastic bottles and salt water to create rudimentary solar stills to extract fresh drinking water through evaporation and condensation. Her plan was a success, providing enough hydration to reinvigorate the group. However, maintaining and expanding the stills would require them to perilously venture close to the shoreline, within reach of the ravenous shark patrolling the shallows. Keeping a vigilant lookout with makeshift spears at the ready, they began digging additional still pits all along the beach, exposing themselves directly to the predator's territory. Their struggle to survive had transformed into a battle of wits and resourcefulness against a relentless, primordial adversary. As the days passed without rescue, the castaways were pitted in an escalating life-or-death contest with the ancient leviathan lurking just offshore. With their solar stills providing only temporary respite, they would have to take even more risks and push their luck further to outlast the island's resident hunter. On the 18th day, Elian and Marvik were hard at work digging a new still pit when the massive bull shark suddenly emerged from the shallows, its gaping jaws wide to ambush them. Acting quickly, Zethrid grabbed one of the sharpened spears and plunged it into the shark's mouth as it lunged. The strike wasn't deep enough to be fatal, but it was enough to drive the primordial beast back and make it reconsider its easy meal. From then on, the castaways' makeshift defensive tactics kept the vengeful shark at bay while maintaining their still operations. Two days later, a marine research vessel passing through the area picked up the group's faint emergency signals and found them just in time to airlift them to safety. Though deeply shaken, the island survivors had outwitted and outlasted one of nature's most formidable predators through their perseverance and ingenuity. In the aftermath, the Melek family used their wealth and influence to champion shark conservation efforts and fund further research into sustainable marine ecosystems. Their harrowing ordeal reminded us that despite our capabilities, Humanity will always be humbled by nature's incredible, inscrutable forces when we encroach on their territory. Sun rose over the remote, pristine waters of Honol's Beach in Hawaii, casting a golden light on the crystal-clear sea. This idyllic location was the perfect setting for the World Free Diving Championship, an event that had drawn the world's best divers to its depths. The air buzzed with excitement and anticipation as competitors prepared for the high-stakes challenge. Among them was Elena Rossi, a seasoned freediver known for grace and endurance. She had trained for years, honing her ability to dive deep on a single breath. Elena felt a familiar thrill as she surveyed the competition site. The water was calm, the visibility exceptional, and the marine life abundant, a freediver's paradise. The world's best freedivers arrived at Holly Bay, each eager to test their limits in the pristine waters. The remote location was chosen for its clear visibility and rich marine life, making it an ideal setting for the high-stakes competition. The divers spent the first day familiarizing themselves with the area, performing warm-up dives and preparing their equipment. As the event began, divers took turns descending into the blue abyss, each striving to reach greater depths and hold their breath longer than their rivals. Safety divers and judges monitored every dive closely, ensuring strict adherence to the competition's rules. Elena's turn came, and she stepped onto the platform, 
breathing deeply to prepare her body for the dive. She focused on the rhythm of her breath, calming her mind and slowing her heart rate. With a final deep inhale, she submerged, kicking powerfully and gliding into the underwater world. The descent was smooth, her movements fluid and controlled. She passed the markers indicating her depth, 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters. At 60 meters, she turned, beginning her ascent. The return to the surface was always the most challenging part, but Elena's training paid off. She maintained her composure and reached the surface with a smile, her lungs burning but victorious. As the day progressed, divers continued to impress with their feats of endurance and skill. But amid the camaraderie and competition, one of the competitors, Eric Johansson, had not resurfaced from his dive. Concern turned to alarm as the minutes ticked by. The safety divers immediately initiated a search, scouring the area where Eric was last seen. Elena joined the effort, her heart heavy with worry. Eric was an experienced diver, and for him to go missing was unthinkable. As she descended again, she scanned the depths, hoping to see her missing colleague. The visibility in Honnell's Beach was excellent, but even so, the ocean could be an unforgiving and mysterious place. Elena and the other divers fanned out, searching methodically. During this search, they encountered something unexpected and terrifying. A giant, aggressive shark patrolling the area. The bull shark was known for its unpredictable behavior and tendency to enter shallow waters. Its presence so close to the competition site was alarming. Elena signaled to the other divers, her heart pounding. They needed to regroup and come up with a plan, both to find Eric and to ensure their safety. On the surface, the divers discussed their options. The competition organizers, aware of the shark's presence, considered suspending the event. But the search for Eric couldn't wait. Elena and other experienced divers volunteered to continue the search despite the danger because they couldn't leave him in the depths. The team agreed and with renewed determination they returned to the water. This time they were armed with spears and shark deterrent devices. The mood was tense and each diver was acutely aware of their risks. Elena descended again, the cool water enveloping her. She moved carefully, her eyes scanning every shadow and crevice. The underwater landscape was beautiful but deceptive, and the shark's presence added an element of fear that was hard to shake. Minutes felt like hours as they searched. Then Elena spotted something, a flash of color against the blue. It was Eric's dive suit caught on a rocky outcrop. She swam towards him, praying he was still alive. Eric was unconscious but breathing shallowly. Elena quickly freed him from the rocks and signaled to the others. They formed a protective circle around him as they began the ascent, the shark still a looming threat. As they ascended, the shark reappeared, circling them with unnerving curiosity. Elena's heart raced, but she focused on the task at hand. They needed to get Eric to the surface safely. One of the divers later used a shark deterrent, emitting an electric pulse that momentarily confused the predator, giving them precious seconds to move. The group reached the surface, and Eric was immediately taken to the medical team. Elena and the others emerged from the water, exhausted but relieved. The danger wasn't over, but they had saved their friend. In the aftermath, the competition was suspended. The organizers and local authorities decided to investigate why the shark had been so aggressive and close to shore. They discovered that recent illegal fishing activity had disrupted the natural balance of the bay. All the sea creatures the shark fed on have been fished out, so these predators got attracted to the shore for food. Elena stayed in Hawaii for several days helping with the investigation and advocating for stricter protections for the marine environment. The incident highlighted the delicate balance of the ecosystem and the importance of respecting and preserving it. Eric recovered slowly, grateful for his fellow divers' efforts. The experience had been harrowing, but it had also brought the community of freed divers closer together. They had faced a formidable challenge and emerged stronger, their bond forged in the ocean's depths. Elena reflected on the events as the divers prepared to leave Hali Bay. The ocean was a place of beauty, wonder, danger, and unpredictability. The experience had tested their limits and reminded them of the respect and caution required to explore its depths. Elena knew she would continue diving, driven by her passion for the ocean and its mysteries. But she would also carry the lessons learned in Holly Bay, a reminder of nature's power and the human spirit's resilience. 
The small coastal town of Liguria in Italy was excited as it prepared for its annual fishing festival. Colorful banners fluttered in the breeze, stalls lined the streets, and the aroma of grilled seafood wafted through the air. This festival was the year's highlight, drawing visitors from around to celebrate the town's rich maritime heritage. The festival's highlight was the grand fishing competition, a test of skill and patience where fishermen from all over vied to catch the biggest fish. This year was no different. The morning of the festival dawned bright and clear, with the smell of salt water mixing with the aroma of freshly baked goods from the vendor stalls lining the docks. Boats of all sizes bobbed gently in the harbor, their owners prepping rods and checking tackle, eager to win the trophy. As the horn sounded to signal the start of the competition, boats sped off to their favorite fishing spots. The air was filled with shouts of encouragement, laughter, and the occasional splash as lines hit the water. Hours passed and fish were caught, some small and some sizable, but none seemed likely to win the trophy. The crowd on the shore grew anxious, eager for news of a record-breaking catch. Then, as the sun descended, a sudden commotion broke out on the water. Chiesa, a young fisherman new to the competition, had hooked something massive. His rod bent nearly double, and his boat rocked violently as he struggled to reel in the unseen giant. Excitement rippled through the crowd. Could this be the fish of the festival? As Chiesa battled with his catch, the water around his boat erupted in a frenzy. Cheers turned to gasps of horror as a dark, unmistakable shape surfaced. It wasn't a fish, but a shark drawn to the struggling creature on Chiesa's line. Before anyone could react, the shark lunged at the fish, its mighty jaws snapping shut just feet from Chiesa's boat. The force of the attack threw him off balance, and he tumbled into the water. Panic swept through the spectators as rescue boats raced towards him. Fishermen and onlookers held their breath, hearts pounding, as Chiesa flailed in the water. A rescue boat reached him in the nick of time, pulling him from the sea just as the shark circled back, Curious, but ultimately uninterested in the human now safely aboard. Other participants quickly directed their boats to the shore as everyone struggled to escape any menacing shark. The incident spread among people present at the event. Among them was Dr. Anna Grant, a young marine biologist from a nearby research institute. She had come to Liguria to enjoy the festivities and perhaps collect some data on local marine life. Anna had always been fascinated by the ocean, and her passion led her to study marine biology, eventually specializing in shark behavior. As Anna wandered through the festival before the incident, she noticed the lively atmosphere. Families strolled through the streets, children played by the docks, and fishermen proudly displayed their best catches. Yet amidst the laughter and merriment, there was a growing sense of unease. At first, Anna couldn't quite place it, but it gnawed at her. Later, after the incident, she overheard a group of fishermen talking in hushed tones at a local cafe. The conversation revealed there had been three shark attacks in the past week, and with the latest one it had become alarming and unusually frequent. Anna's curiosity was piqued, and she introduced herself to the group, learning that the attacks had occurred near the old pier just outside the bay. Determined to investigate, Anna rented a small boat and set off towards the pier with her equipment. The calm sea and golden sunlight did little to ease her concern. Upon arrival, she observed a school of fish behaving erratically, which prompted her to lower her underwater camera. The camera's feed revealed a giant bull shark, a species known for its aggressive nature and unusual presence so close to shore. But why were they here in such numbers? Anna realized she needed more data. She decided to take water samples and noted the temperature and salinity levels. She also collected a fish sample, hoping to find clues in their behavior. In town, Anna analyzed her findings in the small makeshift lab she had set up in her rented cottage. The results were troubling. The water temperature was slightly higher than usual, and the fish showed signs of stress and infection. Something was disrupting the marine ecosystem, drawing the sharks closer to shore. Anna knew she couldn't solve this alone. She needed the local fishermen's knowledge and experience. She returned to the cafe where she had first met Flavio and found him discussing the situation with a group of concerned townspeople. Anna explained her findings to Flavio, a seasoned fisherman, and a group of concerned townspeople. Together they devised a plan to investigate the source of the pollution. 
Over the next few days, they scoured the coastline and the river feeding into the bay, uncovering several sources of contamination. Some of the sources of the pollution are an old factory upstream, illegally dumping waste into the river, several abandoned boats in the bay, leaking fuel and chemicals, and residential areas with improper waste disposal practices. Armed with evidence, Anna contacted local authorities and environmental agencies, pushing for immediate cleanup. The townspeople rallied together, and as the cleanup began, shark sightings near the shore gradually decreased. The festival continued with heightened caution, and Anna monitored the situation closely. Due to the revelation, the festival has been wound down quickly, so the cleanup will be effective. Anna and Flavio reflected on their success. They had faced a crisis and emerged stronger, committed to protecting their environment. In the days that followed, cleanup efforts intensified. The polluting factory was shut down and plans were made to restore the river and bay. The town council implemented stricter regulations and fishermen continued to monitor the waters. Anna's research gained attention and she was invited to present her findings at various conferences, advocating for better environmental practices. Back in Liguria, life gradually returned to normal. The festival ended without further incident, and residents became more aware of the need to safeguard their environment. It was the cool summer of 2014 when a team of experienced divers set their sights on the remote Palau Trench, a deep-sea trench located off the coast of the tiny Pacific Island nation of Palau. For years, rumors had swirled about a sunken treasure ship, its hold brimming with priceless artifacts from a bygone era, lost to this mysterious underwater chasm. Callista Mendoza, a seasoned treasure hunter with a reputation for fearlessness and an insatiable thirst for adventure, led the expedition. Her crew consisted of Alejandro Torres, a former naval officer with extensive diving experience, and the siblings Marissa and Javier Ramirez, both skilled technical divers with a passion for underwater exploration. As their research vessel, the Azul Profundo cut through the vast waters of the Pacific, excitement crackled in the air like static electricity. Callista pored over the faded charts and ancient texts that had guided them to this remote location, her eyes alight with the promise of uncovering a long-lost treasure. She declared that that was it, her voice tinged with a reverence bordering on obsession. It was the resting place of the Dorada del Mar, a Spanish galleon laden with gold and artifacts beyond our wildest dreams. Alejandro, ever the pragmatist, arched an eyebrow skeptically. He confirmed if Caliste was certain the coordinates were accurate because they were venturing into uncharted territory there. Callista shot him a withering glance, asking if she had ever steered them wrong. She let the question hang in the air, her conviction unwavering. The crew made final preparations as the Azul Profundo neared the designated coordinates. Scuba tanks were checked, rebreathers were calibrated, and diving slates were handed out each bearing an intricate map to guide them to their underwater destination. With a collective intake of breath, the divers submerged into the inky depths, their powerful dive lights cutting through the perpetual gloom that enveloped the trench. The descent was slow and methodical, each diver monitoring their air consumption and depth with practiced precision. A sense of awe washed over them as they neared the bottom of the trench. The seabed was littered with the remnants of shipwrecks, their once proud hulls reduced to ghostly skeletons by the relentless passage of time. Ancient amphorae and weathered artifacts peeked through the silt, tantalizing glimpses of the treasures that might lay in wait. Callista signaled for the team to regroup, her eyes shining with excitement. Using her slate, she traced the path they would need to follow, the map leading them deeper into the heart of the trench. The journey was arduous with the divers navigating treacherous terrain and through labyrinthine coral and rock formations. But their perseverance was rewarded when Javier's light illuminated a sight that caused their hearts to skip a beat. Half buried in the silt lay the unmistakable outline of a ship's hull, its timbers warped and encrusted with centuries of marine growth. Callista's eyes widened as she took in the intricate carvings that adorned the stern, a telltale sign that they had indeed stumbled upon the legendary Dorada del Mar. Adrenaline coursing through their veins, the team set about carefully excavating the site, their movements precise and respectful as they uncovered the ship's secrets. Javier and Marissa worked in tandem, 
brushing away layers of silt to reveal the glint of gold and the shimmer of precious gemstones. Alejandro, his military training kicking in, kept a watchful eye on their surroundings, his gaze constantly sweeping the inky depths for any potential threats. It was this vigilance that alerted him to the first sign of danger. Then a massive shadow, darker than the surrounding gloom, emerged from the murky depths, its curved form cutting through the water with lethal grace. Alejandro's blood ran cold as he recognized the unmistakable silhouette of a great white shark, its fearsome jaws agape and its beady eyes fixed on the diving team. Alejandro alerted the others with a frantic series of hand signals to the impending threat. Callista, her face set in grim determination, signaled for them to continue their excavation, unwilling to abandon their hard-won prize. The shark circled closer, its powerful tail propelling it through the water with terrifying speed. Marissa watched in horror as the predator's jaws snapped shut mere inches from her face, the rush of displaced water sending her tumbling backward. Javier, his protective instincts kicking in, positioned himself between his sister and the shark. His eyes narrowed in defiance, but even his bravery paled in the face of the ocean's apex predator, its primordial hunger driving it closer to the team. As the minutes ticked by, tension mounted, each diver acutely aware of their dwindling air supply and the looming threat of the Great White. Callista's face was a mask of concentration as she carefully extracted an ornate golden chalice from the wreckage, her movements slow and deliberate. But the shark's predatory senses, heightened by the scent of blood from a minor cut on Marissa's hand, seemed to grow more agitated with each passing second. Its circling tightened, its powerful tail thrashing the water into a furious maelstrom. Alejandro knew they were running out of time. With a series of urgent hand signals, he conveyed the gravity of the situation to Callista. Her face twisted in anguish, torn between the lure of the treasure and the preservation of her crew's safety. In the end, self-preservation won out. With a heavy heart, Callista signaled for the team to begin their ascent, clutching the golden chalice to her chest as they kicked towards the surface, their movements fueled by desperation. The Great White, sensing its prey slipping away, surged forward with terrifying speed, its jaws snapping shut mere inches from Javier's fin. The young diver propelled himself upwards with a burst of adrenaline-fueled strength, his heart pounding in his ears. The ascent felt like an eternity, each diver painfully aware of their rapidly depleting air supply and the relentless pursuit of the shark. Marissa's eyes widened in horror as the predator closed in on her brother, its jaws agape and its powerful body coiled to strike. Alejandro interposed himself between the shark and Javier in a moment of selfless bravery, brandishing a titanium dive knife in a desperate bid to fend off the attack. The undeterred shark surged forward, its massive bulk slamming into Alejandro with the force of a freight train. The impact sent the former naval officer tumbling through the water, his air supply momentarily cut off as the shark's thrashing tail clipped his regulator. For a few agonizing seconds, he flailed helplessly, his lungs burning for oxygen. Javier, acting on pure instinct, grabbed Alejandro's arm and hauled him towards the surface, his powerful kicks propelling them both upwards with renewed urgency. Marissa and Callista followed close behind, their faces etched with fear and determination. Finally, after an eternity, they breached the surface, their gasping breaths filling the air with a symphony of relief. The great white denied its prey circled menacingly beneath them, its dorsal fin cutting through the water like a razor's edge. As the Azul Profundo's crew hauled them on board, the divers collapsed onto the deck, their bodies trembling with the lingering adrenaline rush of their harrowing encounter. Alejandro, his face pale and his eyes haunted, clutched the titanium dive knife that had saved his life, its blade bent and scarred from the shark's powerful jaws. Later on, the team found themselves grappling with the aftermath of their brush with death. As for the legendary Dorada del Mar, its secrets would remain largely undisturbed, save for the ornate golden chalice that now resided in a museum, a silent testament to the perils and wonders that awaited those daring enough to venture into the depths unknown. The underwater treasure hunt had been a harsh reminder of the fragility of life and the unforgiving nature of the ocean's depths. For the divers, it had been a baptism by fire, a crucible that had forged them into wiser, more cautious explorers of the underwater realm. 
As they looked back on that fateful expedition, they couldn't help but feel a profound sense of gratitude, not for the treasure they had recovered, but for the ultimate prize, their lives snatched from the jaws of death by sheer force of will and the unbreakable bonds of friendship and camaraderie. Radcliffe family's beach day had started like any other sunny July morning in Santa Cruz, California in 2012. Thomas Radcliffe had been taking his son Shane, 14, to the public beaches along Monterey Bay every summer since Shane was a toddler. They loved the ocean, building sandcastles, playing frisbee, and soaking up the warm coastal sunshine. The weather was perfect this Thursday, sunny, 75 degrees, with a light ocean breeze. The Radcliffes arrived at Monterey State Beach around 10 a.m. and began setting up their spot. Shane buried himself in the sand while Thomas fired up the portable grill for lunch. After two hours of playing in the waves and tanning, they ate burgers and hot dogs. Shane begged to go back into the ocean to body surf. Thomas cautioned him to stay near the shore and get out if the waves got too big, or he saw any marine life more considerable than a seagull. Shane agreed and ran towards the gently crashing waves around 50 yards away. The afternoon proceeded usually for a while, with Shane laughing and splashing in the shallows. Around 2 p.m., a commotion started happening at the lifeguard stand. The lifeguards began surveying the waters with binoculars, blowing whistles, and broadcasting evacuation messages over megaphones. They were ordering everyone out of the water immediately. Feeling a sense of dread, Thomas took off running towards the water's edge, shouting over his shoulder for Shane to swim back to him right away. Before Shane could react, a piercing scream rang out from further out in the water where a girl was body surfing. A giant shark fin and thrashing appeared near her. One of the lifeguards shouted there was a shark attack in progress. Shane froze in panic, but Thomas bellowed for him to swim towards him as fast as he could. As Shane started moving, an enormous great white shark erupted from the water between them, its gaping jaws clamping down on Shane's leg. Shane screamed in pain and terror as the shark violently whipped him through the bloody surf. Thomas plunged into the water after his son, desperately splashing towards where the shark had bitten Shane. The shark started to turn back towards the injured boy, seeing him as easy prey. Just as the massive beast began another charge, Thomas reached Shane and pulled him into his arms. Using every ounce of adrenaline-fueled strength, Thomas backpedaled and kicked away from the oncoming shark. The shark's jaws snapped shut just inches from Thomas's face, spraying him with Shane's blood. More lifeguards entered the water to distract and drive the shark away from the father and son. Thomas kept kicking towards the shore with Shane's limp body, leaving a trail of red behind them. Finally, other beachgoers reached out and pulled them the remaining few yards to the sand. Thomas collapsed on the beach, clutching Shane's mangled leg as emergency responders rushed over. Shane was rushed to the hospital in critical condition, having lost a tremendous amount of blood from the shark bite. Doctors worked feverishly to save the teenager's life and keep him from bleeding out. After multiple blood transfusions and intensive surgery, Shane was stabilized but would require further operations and physical therapy. Over the next few months, Shane slowly recovered from his traumatic brush with death. Though he had lost part of his leg, he amazed his physicians with his resilience and determination to walk unaided again. With the support of his family, Shane pushed himself through the painful rehabilitation process. Shane delivered a defiant statement to the media one year later, using his prosthetic leg to walk across the stage at a charity event. He declared that though the shark attack had taken his leg, it would not take his spirit. Shane announced he planned to return to the waters of Monterey Bay that summer to overcome his fears and honor those who had saved his life that fateful day. True to his word, Shane rejoined his dad at Monterey State Beach the following season. Though apprehensive, he first ventured into the ocean, bodyboarded, and rekindled his passion for the marine environment that had once almost taken his life. From then on, Shane dedicated himself to promoting shark conservation efforts and delivering presentations to raise awareness about beach safety. The brutal attack strengthened the bond between father and son and gave them a profound appreciation for life's fragility. Though permanently marked by the scars of that nightmarish day, the Radcliffes emerged with a more profound respect and awe for the power of nature. Their story of perseverance over tragedy became a source of inspiration for many.
On a sunny day in Silicon Valley, employees from a leading software company took advantage of the clear skies to plan a corporate team-building retreat at a California beach. They gathered for a weekend of activities to foster cooperation and camaraderie, enjoying high spirits and engaging in beach ball and other water games. The highlight of the retreat was a beach activity organized by the retreat facilitator Greg Lewis. The team was split into smaller groups and tasked with building makeshift rafts from provided materials. The goal was to paddle out to a buoy anchored about 200 meters from the shore and return, all while racing against other teams. It was a fun and competitive exercise to encourage teamwork and innovation. As the groups worked on their rafts, laughter and friendly banter filled the air. Sarah, the project manager, was in charge of her team, which included Jake, the software engineer, Emma, the marketing specialist, Carlos, the financial analyst, and Lily, the HR coordinator. They worked efficiently, drawing on their diverse skills to construct a sturdy raft. With their raft complete, the team carried it to the water's edge. The sun began to set, casting a golden glow over the ocean. They pushed off, paddling vigorously towards the buoy. The other teams followed suit, and soon the beach was alive with the splashes and shouts of competing groups. About halfway to the buoy, Sarah noticed something unusual. The water around them seemed to darken, and a faint shadow passed beneath their raft. She dismissed it as a trick of the light, focusing instead on the task. She, however, urged her team to keep paddling so they could win. Just as they reached the buoy, the water erupted in a frenzy. A massive shape surged from the depths, colliding with their raft. The impact force threw the team into the water, their shouts of surprise quickly turning to screams of terror. It was a shark, a great white, its massive jaws snapping shut on Jake's leg. Panic set in as the team thrashed in the water, trying to scramble back onto the raft. In the chaos, their communication devices, meant for coordinating with other teams and the facilitator, were submerged and rendered useless. Sarah managed to grab a piece of the shattered raft and clung to it, scanning the water for her teammates. She saw Jake struggling to swim, his leg bleeding from a deep gash. Emma and Carlos held onto another fragment of the raft. Lily, meanwhile, was swimming toward a nearby buoy, her face determined. Sarah called out to Jake and fortunately it worked, bringing him back to his senses. Jake reached her, his face pale with fear and pain because the shark was still in the water. The shark circled them, its dorsal fin cutting through the water. They needed to move fast. Sarah took charge, her mind racing with potential solutions. Then an idea struck. They could utilize the raft pieces to stay afloat and paddle it slowly. They began their slow, agonizing journey back to the beach, the shark shadowing them the entire way. The distance, which had seemed so short during the race, now felt like an impossible expanse. Every second was a battle against the rising panic and the relentless predator stalking them. As they neared the shore, the shark made another pass, bumping into Carlos's piece of the raft. He lost his grip and went under, resurfacing a moment later with a scream as the shark's teeth grazed his side. Two of them reached out to Carlos, pulling him closer to the shore before the shark could get back at him. Together they struggled towards the shore, where the water was too shallow for the shark to follow. Finally their feet touched the sandy bottom. They stumbled onto the beach, exhausted and bleeding. The rest of the retreat participants and facilitators rushed to their aid, their faces etched with shock and horror. One of the facilitators quickly rushed to their makeshift camp to call for emergency services. He relayed their coordinates and the details of the attack. Help was on the way, but it would take time. Returning to the beach, they found the group huddled together, anxiously awaiting their return. The injured tended to do their best with the limited supplies they had. Jake's leg was bandaged, and Carlos's side was cleaned and wrapped. Minutes passed without rescue, mainly because the location was remote. The facilitators and high company officials took turns keeping watch. Relief came at last when a helicopter appeared on the horizon. They waved frantically, signaling their location. The aircraft circled once before landing a short distance away. Paramedics and rescuers poured out, quickly assessing the situation and tending to the injured. As they were airlifted to safety, Sarah reflected on the ordeal. The team-building retreat had taken a disastrous turn, but it had also revealed her team's strength and resilience. They had faced a terrifying and unpredictable threat together and emerged battered but alive. 
In the days that followed, the story of their survival spread, drawing sympathy and admiration. The shark attack was a stark reminder of the ocean's unpredictability and the fragility of human life in the face of nature's raw power. Yet it also underscored the importance of teamwork and the human spirit's ability to endure even the most harrowing challenges. Back at the company, the team members were hailed as heroes. Their bond, forged in the crucible of survival, had grown stronger. They returned to their work with renewed purpose and a deeper appreciation for each other. The incident didn't stop the company from having a retreat, but a safer location was always considered. In the summer of 2015, a team of seasoned underwater archaeologists from the prestigious Xenophon Institute embarked on an ambitious expedition off the sun-drenched shores of Santorini, Greece. Led by the renowned Dr. Eudoxia Papadopoulos and assisted by her colleagues Dr. Zoran Markovich and Dr. Ilya Kozlov, they set out to explore the enigmatic ruins of an ancient shipwreck that had remained undisturbed for centuries. The wreck, believed to be a Roman merchant vessel from the 2nd century AD, was discovered the previous year during a routine seabed survey conducted by local fishermen. Intrigued by the potential historical significance of the find, the Xenophon Institute spent little time in assembling a team of experts to meticulously document and recover any artifacts that could shed light on the lives of those who sailed the Aegean Sea during the height of the Roman Empire. As the team's research vessel Poseidon's Trident approached the dive site, a palpable excitement filled the air. Dr. Papadopoulos, a seasoned veteran of countless underwater expeditions, briefed her colleagues on the dive plan. They would descend in pairs, with Eudoxia and Zoran comprising the first team, followed by Ilya and their junior archaeologist Foibi Katsaros. The crystal-clear waters of the Aegean offered excellent visibility, and as the archaeologists descended, the intricate details of the wreck slowly came into view. The vessel had been remarkably well preserved, with its wooden hull and cargo hold primarily intact, save for a few breaches caused by the passage of time. As Eudoxia and Zoran began their meticulous documentation process, taking photographs and making careful notes on waterproof slates, they were oblivious to the presence of a silent observer, a massive great white shark that had taken up residence near the wreck. The shark, a formidable female measuring over 20 feet in length, had been drawn to the area by the abundance of fish and marine life that thrived among the underwater ruins. Her territory had remained undisturbed for years until the arrival of these strange visitors disrupted the delicate ecosystem she called home. At first, the shark kept her distance, content to observe the strange creatures that had invaded her domain. However, as the archaeologists continued their work, their movements and the bubbles they exhaled began to attract the attention of the smaller fish that served as her prey. Sensing an opportunity, the great white began to circle closer her razor-sharp senses attuned to the slightest vibration in the water. Then Zoran noticed the ominous shadow lingering just beyond the periphery of their vision. Instantly recognizing the unmistakable silhouette of a giant shark, he signaled urgently to Eudoxia, and the two archaeologists immediately aborted their survey, retreating toward the safety of their dive boat. As they ascended, they caught a glimpse of the massive predator, her powerful tail propelling her effortlessly through the water. The team debated their next move on board the Poseidon's Trident. Abandoning the expedition was out of the question. The wreck held too much historical significance, and the Xenophon Institute had invested considerable resources into this endeavor. Undeterred, Eudoxia devised a daring plan. They would return to the wreck, but this time armed with a series of specialized deterrents to keep the shark at bay. Ilya and Foibe would descend first, equipped with a powerful underwater speaker system emitting low-frequency sound waves known to deter sharks. Meanwhile, Eudoxia and Zorin would follow, carrying a potent shark repellent from a concentrated mixture of chemicals designed to overwhelm the shark's keen sense of smell. With their preparations complete, the archaeologists again entered the azure depths, their hearts pounding with anticipation and trepidation. As Ilya and Foibe activated the sound system, the low, pulsating tones reverberated through the water, creating an invisible barrier around the wreck site. It seemed their plan had worked briefly, and the Great White had been driven away. 
But just as the team began to relax, the unmistakable shadow appeared once more, larger and more menacing than before. Undeterred by the sound waves, the shark recognized the threat to her territory and was now thoroughly roused to defend it. With a powerful flick of her tail, she charged towards the wreck, her massive jaws agape and her rows of serrated teeth glinting in the filtered sunlight. Panic gripped the archaeologists as they scrambled to deploy the shark repellent, but the predator moved too quickly. She swept past Ilya and Foibe in a blur of motion, her powerful tail striking Ilya's air tank and rupturing it with a sickening crack. As bubbles streamed from the ruptured tank, Ilya's eyes widened in terror. He had only a few precious minutes of air remaining. Without hesitation, Foibe shared her regulator with her colleague, and the two began a frantic ascent towards the surface. Meanwhile, Eudoxia and Zoran found themselves trapped beneath the wreck, their path to the surface blocked by the enraged shark. With their air supplies rapidly dwindling, they realized that their only hope lay in seeking temporary refuge within the confines of the ancient ship itself. Carefully navigating the maze of sunken timbers and cargo holds, the two archaeologists found a relatively intact chamber that offered a brief respite from the circling predator. But as the minutes ticked by, their oxygen levels dropped perilously low, and the shark showed no signs of relenting. In a desperate gambit, Eudoxia retrieved a small waterproof case from her dive bag, a device she had brought along as a last resort. Inside was a potent electrical beauty designed to temporarily incapacitate more giant marine creatures without causing permanent harm. Bracing themselves, Eudoxia and Zoran emerged from their sanctuary. The beauty gripped tightly in Eudoxia's hand. As the Great White charged once more, her massive bulk filling their field of vision, Eudoxia aimed and fired. The powerful electrical current lanced through the water, momentarily stunning the shark and causing her to veer off course. Seizing their opportunity, the two archaeologists made a mad dash for the surface, their lungs burning and their limbs leaden from exertion. Just as their air supplies reached critical levels, they broke through the surface, gasping for breath and clinging to the safety line that led back to Poseidon's trident. Ilya and Foibe, having already been retrieved by the support crew, greeted them with a mixture of relief and awe at their harrowing escape. As the team recovered from their ordeal, they knew that their encounter with the Great White Shark had been a sobering reminder of nature's power and majesty. Though they had emerged victorious, they had also gained a newfound respect for the delicate balance beneath the waves. Later, the Xenophon Institute's team would make numerous groundbreaking discoveries within the wreck, shedding new light on the lives of those who had traversed the ancient trade routes of the Mediterranean. But for Eudoxia, Zoran, Ilya, and Foibe, the true treasure they had unearthed was a deeper appreciation for the incredible resilience of life itself and the knowledge that even in the face of adversity, the human spirit could prevail. It was the summer of 2018 in the small coastal town of Donsil, Philippines. The quaint village was nestled between lush green hills and the shimmering azure waters of the Pacific Ocean. For generations, the locals had coexisted harmoniously with the diverse marine life in the area's rich ecosystem. However, a group of eco-tourists was about to experience a terrifying ordeal that would shatter the tranquil facade of this seaside paradise. Quentin Delgado, a renowned marine biologist, organized the tour to raise awareness about preserving the delicate balance of the local marine environment. Among the participants were Zarina Villanueva, a passionate environmentalist, and her husband, Javier Reyes, an amateur photographer eager to capture the wonders of the underwater world. The tour group boarded the Cassiana, a sturdy yet weathered fishing vessel captained by the grizzled local Thomas Alvarez. His first mate, the young and energetic Maricel Santos ensured all safety protocols were in place. The plan was to embark on a diving expedition to observe the magnificent whale sharks that frequented the waters off the coast of Donsil. As the Cassiana set sail, the tourists' excited chatter filled the air. Quentin briefed them on the importance of maintaining a respectful distance from the gentle giants, emphasizing that their presence should not disrupt the sharks' natural behavior. With their diving gear in order and anticipation brewing, the group eagerly awaited their first encounter with the majestic creatures. After an hour, 
Tomas skillfully maneuvered the boat to a spot renowned for whale shark sightings. The crystal clear waters offered excellent visibility, and the tourists eagerly donned their diving gear. One by one, they slipped beneath the surface, their eyes wide with wonder as they caught their first glimpses of the massive spotted sharks gliding gracefully through the azure expanse. For a while, the experience was nothing short of breathtaking. The whale sharks, seemingly unperturbed by the divers' presence, continued their serene dance through the vibrant coral gardens. Her heart swelling with joy, Zarina gestured excitedly to Javier, who eagerly snapped away with his camera, capturing the majestic creatures in their natural habitat. However, their blissful reverie was shattered when a sudden jarring noise reverberated through the water. The anchored Cassiana had drifted dangerously close to a treacherous reef, and the anchor chain had become entangled in the sharp coral formations. Tomas and Maricel, realizing the gravity of the situation, immediately signaled for the divers to resurface. As the group hastily ascended, a sense of unease settled over them. The commotion caused by the struggling vessel had attracted the attention of a different kind of shark, one far more menacing than the gentle whale sharks they had been observing. Quinton's experienced eye immediately recognized the telltale silhouettes of oceanic white-tip sharks, their sleek bodies cutting through the water with predatory grace. These apex predators, known for their aggressive nature, had likely been drawn to the area by the thrashing of the anchor chain and the disturbance it had caused. With the divers safely back on board, Tomas and Maricel worked feverishly to free the anchor, their efforts punctuated by the ominous circling of the white-tip sharks. The tourists huddled together, their hearts pounding as they watched the sharks increasingly agitated by the ongoing disturbance. Zarina clutched Javier's hand, her knuckles turning white with fear. She whispered to Javier, her voice trembling. Quinton, his brow furrowed with concern, addressed the group. He urged them to remain calm. These sharks were highly territorial and had been drawn to the area by the noise and movement. Their best course of action was to stay as still and quiet as possible until they could free the anchor and get the boat moving again. It was easier said than done as the shark's circling grew tighter and more menacing with each passing minute. The tourists could feel the tension in the air, thick enough to cut with a knife. Tomas and Maricel redoubled their efforts, their muscles straining against the stubborn anchor chain. Finally, with a tremendous heave, the anchor broke free, and the Cassiana lurched forward, propelled by the powerful currents. Relief washed over the group as the white-tip sharks fell behind, their interest waning as the disturbance subsided. However, their respite was short-lived. The propeller churned the waters as the Cassiana gained speed, kicking up a heated trail of bubbles and vibrations. To the sharks, this new disturbance was an irresistible lure, and they gave chase, their sleek bodies cutting through the water with terrifying speed. The tourists watched in horror as the first white-tip shark closed in, its mighty jaws snapping mere feet away from the stern of the boat. Maricel uttered a terrified shriek, her hands flying to her mouth in shock. Quentin, his mind racing, turned to Thomas. He urged Thomas that they needed to cut the engine and let the current carry them away from the sharks. The vibrations and noise only attracted them further. Tomas nodded grimly, his weathered face etched with concern. He killed the engine, and the Cassiana drifted silently. The only sound, the gentle lapping of waves against the hull. For a moment, it seemed as though the plan had worked. The sharks fell back, their interest seemingly waning. But then, one particularly bold white tip surged forward, its mighty jaws clamping down on the wooden gunnel, splintering the wood with a sickening crunch. The tourists recoiled in terror, their screams piercing the air. Javier, his camera forgotten, clutched Zarina protectively to his chest, his eyes wide with fear. Quentin, his heart pounding, knew they had to act quickly. They needed a diversion to draw the sharks away from the boat. Without hesitation, the grizzled captain grabbed the bucket of fish guts and began tossing handfuls into the water, creating a trail that led away from the boat. The sharks, their predatory instincts peaked, immediately gave chase, their sleek bodies disappearing into the depths in pursuit of the tantalizing scent. For a brief moment, the group breathed a collective sigh of relief. However, their respite was short-lived. As the last chum dissipated, the sharks began to circle back, their hunger unsated. This time, they were joined by even more white tips, drawn to the area by the promise of an easy meal. 
The tourists huddled together, their faces etched with fear as the sharks closed in again. Tomas was already working on the ignition. The engine sputtered and the Cassiana lurched forward, cutting through the water with renewed speed. Time seemed to slow as one of the shark's gaping maw descended, its razor-sharp teeth glinting in the sunlight. Maricel screamed, her hands flying to her face in terror. But at the last moment, a stroke of luck intervened. The shark's trajectory was slightly off, and instead of clamping down on the boat, its jaws closed around the trailing anchor chain. The shark thrashed violently, its powerful body twisting and writhing as it struggled to free itself from the unyielding metal links. The Cassiana surged forward, putting distance between itself and the enraged shark. As the minutes ticked by, the white tips gradually fell behind, their interest waning as the boat reached the safety of the shallower waters near the shore. The tourists disembarked on shaky legs, their faces ashen, and their bodies trembling from the harrowing ordeal they had just endured. Zarina clung to Javier, her eyes wide and haunted, while Quentin and the rest of the group huddled together, drawing strength from their shared survival. Tomas finally broke the silence, his gruff voice tinged with relief. He chuckled, though his laughter held a nervous edge as he claimed the ordeal was close. Quentin nodded solemnly, his brow furrowed with concern, and murmured that they were fortunate to make it back in one piece. Maricel, still visibly shaken, let out a shuddering breath. She whispered that she had never seen anything like that, as the sharks were relentless. As the group made their way back to the safety of the shore, they couldn't help but reflect on the fragile balance between humans and the mighty predators of the sea. What had begun as an innocent eco-tour, a chance to observe the majesty of nature up close, had quickly devolved into a life-or-death struggle against the very creatures they had come to admire. As they went their separate ways, each carrying the scars of their ordeal, they knew they would never again look at the sea with the same sense of wonder and innocence. The eco-tour had gone wrong, but in the process, they gained a newfound respect for the delicate balance between humans and the ancient predators that called the ocean their domain. The year was 2013, and a group of intrepid urban explorers had set their sights on an irresistible new target. Ely's Point Lighthouse. This abandoned and decrepit structure stood sentinel over the treacherous waters of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Led by the fearless Xavion Blackwell and his daring companions, Kelsey Wyndham and Mikkel Sorensen, the trio was determined to uncover the secrets behind the lighthouse's crumbling facade. Ely's Point Lighthouse had a storied and often tragic history. It guided countless ships through the dangerous shoals and sandbars that dotted the Cape's coastline for over a century. However, with modern navigation technologies, the lighthouse fell into disrepair and was eventually decommissioned, left to the mercy of the relentless ocean winds and waves. As their boat drew closer to the isolated outcrop upon which the lighthouse stood, Xavion briefed his team on the plan. They would first explore the underwater base of the structure, utilizing their scuba gear to document any artifacts or architectural features that lay submerged beneath the churning waters. Once that task was complete, they would ascend to the lighthouse, braving the precarious exterior to access the interior and capture footage of its decaying interior. With eager anticipation, the trio donned their diving gear and slipped beneath the surface, their powerful underwater lights cutting through the murky depths like ethereal beacons. As they descended towards the lighthouse's base, a sense of awe washed over them. The structure's massive granite blocks, encrusted with barnacles and swaying kelp fronds, seemed to stretch endlessly towards the seafloor. A skilled underwater photographer, Kelsey, eagerly began capturing images of the intricate stonework, her camera lens drawn to the elaborate carvings and details that the relentless tides had obscured for decades. Ever the historian, Mikael meticulously documented any artifacts or remnants they encountered, his keen eye picking out the subtlest clues that could shed light on the lighthouse's forgotten past. During one of their exploratory sweeps, Xavion noticed something amiss. A trail of blood and discarded fish remains leading from the depths toward the lighthouse's base. His brow furrowed with concern as he signaled to his teammates, and they quickly regrouped, their earlier enthusiasm tempered by a sense of unease. As if summoned by their growing trepidation, a massive shadow emerged from the gloom, 
its colossal bulk dwarfing their slender forms. In that heart-stopping moment, they came face to face with the source of their newfound terror, a massive great white shark, its cold black eyes fixed upon them with predatory intent. Instinctively, the trio began swimming towards the nearest visible exit, a narrow stonework gap leading to the surface. But the shark, sensing their fear, gave chase, its powerful tail propelling it through the water with terrifying speed. Kelsey was the first to reach the opening, her slender frame slipping through the gap with mere inches to spare. Mikael followed close behind, his bulky frame scraping against the jagged edges of the stone as he hauled himself towards the surface. But Xavion was not so fortunate. Just as he neared the opening, the great white lunged, its massive jaws snapping shut mere inches from his legs. In a desperate act of self-preservation, he hurled his dive knife at the shark, momentarily distracting it and giving him precious seconds to swim toward the safety of the lighthouse's base. As Xavion broke the surface, gasping for air, he was greeted by the frantic cries of his teammates. Kelsey and Mikael had managed to clamber onto the narrow ledge that encircled the lighthouse's base, their faces etched with fear and concern. But their ordeal was far from over. The enraged shark had followed Xavion to the surface and was now circling the structure, its massive bulk cutting through the waves like a living torpedo. With no immediate means of escape and their boat anchored too far away to signal for help, the trio was in a desperate race against time. Mikael first spotted their potential salvation, a rusted but sturdy-looking ladder that ascended the side of the lighthouse leading to the top. With renewed determination, the three friends began the treacherous climb, their hands and feet finding purchase on the weathered rungs as they inched their way upwards. Time and again, the great white would surge towards them, its gaping jaws snapping at their dangling limbs, only to be thwarted by the unyielding granite walls of the lighthouse. But with each passing minute, their strength waned, their muscles burning with fatigue as they hauled themselves higher and higher. Finally, as the sun began to lay below the horizon, they reached the top of the lighthouse, their bodies battered and bruised, but their spirits soaring with triumph. They could see their boat bobbing in the distance from their elevated vantage point, their crew blissfully unaware of the harrowing ordeal that had unfolded. Thinking quickly, Xavion retrieved a flare gun from his pack and fired a brilliant crimson flare into the fading light, the signal piercing the gathering darkness like a beacon of hope. Their crew spotted the distress signal within minutes and rapidly closed in on their position. As the boat drew near, the Great White made one final desperate lunge towards the lighthouse, its massive jaws snapping shut mere feet from where the trio huddled. But it was too late. Their crew had witnessed the shark's attack. The Great White swiftly hauled the battered explorers aboard, leaving the enraged predator to circle the lighthouse's base, its territorial rage slowly subsiding as it realized the futility of its pursuit. In the following days, Xavion, Kelsey, and Mikael's harrowing ordeal became the stuff of legend, a tale of survival and resilience in the face of nature's most fearsome predator. Their harrowing experience served as a sobering reminder of the delicate balance within the natural world, and the profound respect that must be afforded to the creatures that call these wild places home. The ordeal at Eli's Point Lighthouse had forged an unbreakable bond, a shared experience that would forever unite them in their love for urban exploration and the thrill of discovery. Though the memory of the Great White's relentless pursuit would linger, it would only fuel their passion for adventure. For they knew that in the heart of the unknown, true wonder awaited those brave enough to seek it out. In the remote waters of the South Pacific, an oceanographic research vessel carried a team of scientists studying shark migration patterns to uncover the mysteries of these majestic predators. Led by Dr. Rachel Foster, the team included marine biologist Dr. James Rivera, shark behaviorist Dr. Emily Chen, oceanographer Dr. Marcus Powell, and field technician Kyle Dawson. Each member brought a wealth of expertise to the mission, and their camaraderie had grown over weeks of working together. The day started like any other, with the team collecting data, tagging sharks and deploying underwater cameras. The weather was calm and the sea was a vast expanse of blue stretching in all directions. Spirits were high as they prepared for another successful day of research. After reviewing the data on her tablet, 
Emily talked to the group. They seem to have some great footage from their previous tagging expedition. So the next step is to plan a dive accordingly. As the team busied themselves with preparations, the sky darkened ominously. Rachel, ever vigilant, checked the weather forecast. A storm was predicted to pass nearby, but it seemed far enough away not to pose a threat. Still, she felt a twinge of unease, so she warned the group about the weather if it started to look bad. By midday, the waves had grown choppier and the wind picked up, sending sprays of salty water over the deck. The team hurried to secure their equipment and brace for the worsening conditions. They had faced storms before, but the ocean's unpredictability always warranted caution. Suddenly, without warning, a rogue wave loomed on the horizon, a towering wall of water moving with terrifying speed. Rachel barely had time to shout a warning before the wave crashed into the vessel, capsizing it and throwing the crew into the tumultuous sea. The world turned into a whirlpool of chaos. Rachel struggled to the surface, gasping for air. She saw the overturned hull of their ship and beyond it, her colleagues fighting to stay afloat. She swam towards the wreckage, grabbing onto a piece of floating debris. She also instructed others to hold something so they could stay together. One by one, the team gathered around the makeshift raft of debris. James clutched a waterproof bag, which he had managed to grab as the ship went under. Inside were a few crucial supplies, such as a first aid kit, small amounts of food, and a handheld radio, which would come in handy in such a period. Marcus assesses their situation, and they try to improve by using the small kit with James. While they inventoried their supplies, Emily's face suddenly went pale. When Rachel looked concerned, she beckoned at her to look. Rachel followed Emily's gaze and saw a fin slicing through the water. Then another, and another. They were in the midst of a shark feeding ground. They were right in the middle of what they wanted to research. The irony was not lost on them. They had come to study sharks and found themselves in a perilous situation, surrounded by the creatures they sought to understand. Their only weapon is their knowledge of shark behavior, and they must put that to good use. The group formed a tight circle, using the floating debris to create a barrier between themselves and the sharks. Rachel and Emily took the lead, sharing insights on shark behavior. As the hours passed, the sharks circled but kept their distance, more curious than aggressive. The team took turns keeping watch, maintaining a vigilant eye on the predators. While they waited for unforeseen help, the night fell and the temperature dropped. The darkness added another layer of fear to their predicament. The sharks were still invisible but ever-present, their movements detectable only by the occasional ripple or bump against the debris. Rachel knew they needed to stay positive to keep morale up, so she started a conversation about what each of them would do when they escaped the death situation they were in. The question was first thrown at James. He forced a smile and said a vast burger would be a gift to celebrate another chance at life. Marcus replied with a hot shower and a sleep like there was nothing to do, while Emily said she'd take a break from the ocean and try other adventures. The conversation helped distract them from their immediate fears, but the night was long and unforgiving. Dawn brought relief as the light returned, but their situation remained dire. Rachel was the first to notice a change in the shark's behavior. They seemed more agitated, swimming faster and coming closer to the group. She knew this was a bad sign. Then they saw a more enormous shark, its massive body gliding through the water with a predatory grace. It was the dominant shark in the area, and its presence had unsettled the others. The team huddled closely as that was the only way they could think. The shark circled them, its dark eyes assessing the strange cluster of humans and debris. It made a few tentative passes each time getting closer. Time had dragged on, and the sun was climbing higher in the sky. Dehydration and fatigue were setting in, and Rachel knew they couldn't hold out much longer without help. As despair began, Marcus noticed something on the horizon, a boat. They didn't believe it initially, but the small dot on the horizon grew larger, heading straight towards them. The team waved frantically, shouting for help. As the boat approached, they could see it was a rescue vessel, alerted by their earlier distress signal. The rescue team quickly pulled them aboard, assessing their condition and providing water and blankets. Rachel felt relief wash over her as they sped towards safety. Back on solid ground, the team was debriefed and given medical attention. 
They were exhausted and shaken, but grateful to be alive. Their knowledge and teamwork had kept them alive despite a terrifying ordeal. In the following days, their story spread through the scientific community and beyond. They were hailed for their survival and ability to apply their expertise in a life-or-death situation. The experience had bonded them in a way few others could understand, and they emerged from the ordeal with a renewed sense of purpose. Reflecting on their ordeal, Rachel realized that their brush with death had given them a deeper appreciation for the creatures they studied. The sharks, so often misunderstood and feared, had been both a threat and a testament to the delicate balance of the ocean's ecosystem. Returning to their research, the team continued their work with a newfound respect for the power and unpredictability of the sea. They knew that the knowledge they gained could help protect both humans and sharks, fostering a greater understanding of the intricate dance between predator and prey. It was a balmy summer afternoon in 2011, when Tyrim Wingarden and his lifelong friend Alicia Morhu set out on a kayaking adventure along the rugged coastline of New Zealand's Fiordland National Park. The two avid outdoorsmen had embarked on countless adventures together. Still, this excursion promised something extraordinary the opportunity to explore the remote and largely untouched waterways of one of the world's most pristine wilderness areas. As their sleek kayaks cut through the glassy waters of Dusky Sound, the towering peaks of the Southern Alps loomed in the distance, their snow-capped summits reflecting brilliantly in the calm waters. Tyrim, a seasoned kayak guide, and Alicia, a marine biologist, had carefully planned their route aiming to venture into the hidden coves and inlets that few had ever laid eyes upon. Hours ticked by as they paddled, the rhythmic strokes of their paddles and the gentle lapping of the waves against their hulls, the only sounds breaking the tranquil silence. Suddenly, a narrow opening in the rocky shoreline caught Tyrim's eye, a secluded cove, its entrance partially obscured by a curtain of cascading waterfalls. Exchanging an excited glance with Alicia, the two friends steered their kayaks towards the hidden inlet, their hearts racing with the thrill of discovery. As they navigated the narrow passage, the towering cliffs seemed to close around them, casting deep shadows across the water's glassy surface. Emerging into the cove, they were greeted by a breathtaking sight, a pristine, crystal-clear lagoon encircled by steep, verdant cliffs. The water was so clear that they could make out every detail of the rocky seafloor below teeming with vibrant marine life and swaying kelp forests. Alicia was the first to notice the telltale signs of something amiss. A trail of blood and discarded fish remains leading from the mouth of the cove towards the open ocean. Her expression grew grave as she pointed out the gruesome evidence to Tyrim, her mind instantly recognizing the implications. Somewhere in these waters a large predator was lurking. As if on cue, a massive shadow glided beneath their kayaks, its bulk causing the lightweight vessels to rock precariously in the water. In that heart-stopping moment, Tyrim and Alicia came face to face with the source of their newfound terror, a colossal great white shark, its massive jaws agape and its cold black eyes fixed upon them with predatory intent. Instinctively, the two friends began paddling furiously towards the narrow exit of the cove, their kayaks slicing through the water with desperate urgency. But the shark, sensing their fear, gave chase, its powerful tail propelling it through the water with terrifying speed. As they neared the passage, Tyrim glanced back to see the Great White's gaping maw mere feet away, its serrated teeth glinting in the filtered sunlight. In a split-second decision, he veered sharply to the left, using his kayak to block the shark's path and give Alicia a narrow opportunity to escape. The plan worked, and Alicia slipped through the narrow opening her kayak scraping against the rocky walls as she emerged into the open waters of Dusky Sound. But Tyrim was not so fortunate. The massive shark slammed into his kayak with the force of a freight train, shattering the lightweight craft into splinters and sending him tumbling into the churning water. Gasping for air, Tyrim found himself treading water mere feet from the enraged predator, his heart pounding in his ears as the shark circled him, sizing up its prey. In a desperate act of self-preservation, he hurled the remains of his shattered kayak at the shark, momentarily distracting it and giving him a precious few seconds to swim toward the safety of the cove's rocky walls. 
Meanwhile, Alicia had doubled back, her mind racing as she formulated a daring plan to rescue her friend. Retrieving a waterproof flare gun from her kayak's emergency kit, she paddled towards the mouth of the cave, hoping to lure the shark away from Tyreem's location. As the great white turned its attention towards the bright flare sizzling on the water's surface, Elysia seized her chance. Paddling with every ounce of strength she possessed, she guided her kayak towards Tyreem's position. Her eyes locked on his struggling form as he clung precariously to the jagged rocks. In a heart-stopping moment, Elysia reached out and hauled her friend into the kayak, the slender vessel rocking violently under their combined weight. But their ordeal was far from over. Enraged by the flare's intrusion, the shark had redirected its fury towards them, its massive bulk cutting through the water like a living torpedo. With adrenaline coursing through their veins, Tyrim and Alicia paddled for their lives, their kayaks slicing through the choppy waters as they desperately sought to outpace the relentless predator. Time and again, the Great White would surge towards them, its gaping jaws snapping mere inches from their fragile craft, only to veer off at the last moment, biding its time for the perfect opportunity to strike. As the hours ticked by and their strength waned, the friends grew increasingly disoriented, their sense of direction lost in the labyrinth of fjords and inlets surrounding them. But just as despair began to set in, they spotted a familiar landmark in the distance, the towering peak of Mitre Peak, an iconic symbol of Fjordland National Park. With renewed determination, they paddled towards the looming mountain, using it as a guiding beacon to steer them back to the safety of the main channel. As they finally emerged from the treacherous maze of waterways, the unmistakable silhouette of their support vessel, the Kaitiaki, came into view. In a desperate final push, Tyrim and Alicia mustered every ounce of their remaining strength, their arms burning with fatigue as they paddled toward the waiting boat. As they neared the Kaitiaki's hull, the Great White made one last, desperate lunge, its massive jaws snapping shut mere inches from their kayak. But it was too late. The Kaitiaki crew had witnessed the harrowing chase and swiftly hauled the battered adventurers aboard, leaving the enraged shark to circle the vessel. Its territorial rage slowly subsided as it realized the futility of its pursuit. Tyrim and Elysia's harrowing ordeal became a legend, a tale of survival and resilience in the face of nature's most fearsome predator. Their harrowing experience served as a sobering reminder of the delicate balance within the wilderness and the profound respect that must be afforded to the creatures that call these wild places home. For Tyrim and Alicia, the nightmare in the hidden cove had forged an unbreakable bond, a shared experience that would forever unite them in their love for the great outdoors and the thrill of adventure. And though the memory of the Great White's relentless pursuit would linger, it would only fuel their passion for exploration. For they knew that true adventure awaited those brave enough to seek it out in the heart of the wilderness. A group of six friends embarked on a sailing adventure around Maui, one of Hawaii's biggest and most remote islands. They had no idea their trip would be more adventurous than they could imagine. Although Alex Duran was the last person to know about the planned trip, little effort was made to convince him to join the adventure trip because he was a chronic sea lover. The friends, bonded by years of adventures and shared experiences, had embarked on a sailing trip across a remote part of the Pacific Ocean. The sturdy boat was their home for the next two weeks. The first few days were idyllic. The friends laughed, reminisced, and enjoyed the breathtaking beauty of the open ocean. They fished, swam, and marveled at the diverse marine life Alex identified with enthusiasm. The journey was a much-needed break from their hectic lives, offering a rare opportunity to reconnect and explore the unknown. However, the mood shifted on the fourth day as they navigated through a particularly isolated stretch of water. The sky turned an ominous shade of gray, and the wind picked up, ruffling the ocean's calm surface. Tom, who was in charge of steering the yacht, was focused, his experienced eyes scanning the horizon and the boat's instruments. The sudden change in weather was unexpected, but not entirely uncommon in these parts. He only wants everyone to stay alert as they seem to be approaching a storm. As the waves grew more prominent and the boat began to rock more violently, the friends secured loose items and donned life jackets. The storm hit with a ferocity that took them by surprise, 
Without warning, a loud grating noise reverberated through the hull. The boat lurched violently, throwing the friends off balance. Tom's heart sank. He knew that sound all too well. They had been hit and Tom yelled over the roar for them to check the damage. Alex and one of his friends, Mark, rushed below deck, wading through ankle-deep water already seeping in. Their faces went pale as they saw the gash along the bottom of the hull. Water was pouring in at an alarming rate. They had no choice but to abandon the ship. The group quickly gathered the essentials, a first aid kit, emergency rations, flares, and the emergency beacon. They hurried to deploy the life raft, the situation growing more desperate with each passing second. As they inflated the raft and began to load it, the boat's distress signals triggered, sending a series of flashes and sounds into the stormy night. The signals, however, attracted more than just potential rescuers. One by one, they climbed into the raft, the realization of their predicament sinking in. The boat was going down and they were now adrift in the ocean. As they floated away from the sinking boat, a new threat emerged from the deep. Dark shapes circled beneath the surface, drawn by the vibrations and scent of the wreckage. Mark, a marine biologist, recognized the danger immediately. He quickly told them to stay calm and keep their movements minimal because sharks are attracted to noise and splashing. By then, the storm had stopped and the friends huddled together in the small raft, their eyes scanning the water for any sign of the predators. They stayed like this until the night became pitch black. The only light came from their emergency lantern because their phones went down with the boat. The friends took turns keeping watch, their senses heightened by fear and adrenaline. Around midnight, the first real test of their resolve came. A large shadow appeared beneath the raft, followed by a bump that nearly toppled them into the water. Mark, gripping the fishing spear tightly, jabbed at the shadow, hitting something solid. The shark recoiled, but it wasn't alone. More shadows joined the fray, their dorsal fins cutting through the water like knives. The friends fought to maintain their composure, each struggling with fear and fatigue. Alex kept a close eye on everyone's condition, aware panic and injury could be as deadly as the sharks. Dawn was still hours away and the night seemed endless. The attacks were sporadic but relentless, each one testing their endurance. A shark bit into the raft's side at one point, causing a small tear. Alex, quick to act, used the repair kit to patch the hole, his hands shaking but steady. They can't do this forever, so Tom suggests they utilize the flares they've got from the vessel. The first light of dawn brought a sliver of hope. The sky turned from black to deep blue, then to sunrise's soft pink and orange. The friend's spirits lifted slightly, though their situation was still dire. They prepared the flares, waiting for the right moment to send a signal. As the sun rose, painting the ocean in a palette of colors, they fired the first flare. It shot into the sky, a bright red streak against the pastel dawn. They watched it arc and descend, praying that someone, somewhere, would see it. Minutes felt like hours as they waited for a response. The sharks were still present but seemed less aggressive in the daylight. The friends took turns firing flares, each one a beacon of their hope and desperation. Finally, as the sun climbed higher, a distant sound reached their ears, the unmistakable hum of an aircraft. They looked up, squinting against the bright sky, and saw a small plane heading their way. Cheers of relief erupted from the raft as they waved and signaled frantically. The plane circled overhead, its pilot spotting the flares in the life raft. The friends watched as it dipped its wings in acknowledgement before flying off, presumably to summon help. Their ordeal was far from over, but knowing that rescue was on its way gave them the strength to persevere. Hours later, a rescue boat appeared on the horizon, speeding towards them. The friends' exhaustion melted into overwhelming relief as they were pulled aboard, one by one. The seasoned professional's crew quickly assessed their condition and provided water and blankets. As they sped towards the nearest island, the friends clung to each other, grateful to be alive. The ordeal had tested them in ways they could never have imagined, but it had also reinforced their bond. They had faced the abyss together and survived. They didn't stay for long before returning to the U.S. to get their lives back to normalcy. In 2012, five friends embarked on an adventurous camping trip to the secluded coast of El Nido, Palawan, Philippines. 
The pristine beaches, fringed by towering limestone cliffs and lush tropical foliage, promised a serene escape from the hustle and bustle of city life. Leading the charge was Liam Mercado, an outdoor enthusiast who thirsted for exploration. His friends, Samantha Villanueva, Jericho Reyes, Miguel Santos, and Isabel Alvarez, shared his passion for adventure and were eager to trade the concrete jungle for a few days of untamed beauty. As their pickup truck rumbled along the winding coastal road, the group couldn't help but marvel at the breathtaking scenery that unfolded before them. The azure waters of the West Philippine Sea sparkled invitingly, while the white sandy beaches seemed to beckon them towards a tranquil paradise. After a two-hour drive, they finally reached their destination, a remote cove tucked away from the well-trodden tourist spots. Liam had stumbled upon this hidden gem during a previous hiking expedition and couldn't wait to share its beauty with his friends. They quickly set up their tents, assembling a cozy base camp amidst the swaying palm trees. The waves gently lapping against the shore provided a soothing backdrop to their laughter and banter as they unpacked their supplies. The first day was spent lounging on the beach, soaking up the warm tropical sun and swimming in the crystal clear waters. Jericho, a self-proclaimed adrenaline junkie, even managed to convince the group to try their hand at cliff jumping from the nearby limestone formations. As the sun began to dip towards the horizon, painting the sky in brilliant hues of orange and pink, Samantha noticed something peculiar. She signaled the rest to confirm if they had seen something, her brow furrowed in concern. The others turned to follow her gaze, scanning the water's surface. That's when they spotted a dark triangular fin slicing through the waves, unmistakably belonging to a shark. Liam waved it off, his voice reassuring. Liam was not worried as the thought of it probably being just a reef shark came in. He exclaimed that they were harmless and quite common in those waters. The group accepted his explanation, but Samantha couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that had settled in the pit of her stomach. As night fell, they gathered around the crackling campfire, roasting marshmallows and swapping stories the earlier sighting of the shark temporarily forgotten. A natural storyteller, Miguel regaled them with tales of his previous camping adventures, his animated gestures casting flickering shadows across their faces. It wasn't until the following morning that the true gravity of their situation became apparent. Isabel had woken early, drawn to the tranquil waters by the promise of a refreshing morning swim. As she waded into the shallows, her eyes widened in shock at the sight before her. Dozens of sharks, their sleek bodies gliding effortlessly through the turquoise waters, patrolled the shoreline. Panic gripped her and she hurried back to the safety of the beach, her heart pounding in her chest. She cried, signaling them to wake up, her voice tinged with fear. There were sharks everywhere. The others sprang into action, their eyes widening as they took in the unsettling scene. The once peaceful cove had transformed into a veritable feeding ground, teeming with the unmistakable silhouettes of hungry sharks. Liam's face paled as he recognized the distinctive shape of the predators, black-tip reef sharks, known for their aggressive nature and territorial behavior. He muttered that it wasn't good, his mind racing to formulate a plan. They needed to return to the truck and leave there immediately. The group quickly packed up their belongings, their movements hurried and tense. Ever the daredevil, Jericho couldn't resist one last dip in the water, much to the other's dismay. As he waded out into the shallows, the sharks seemed to take notice, their sleek bodies drawing closer to the thrashing figure. Samantha watched in horror as one particularly bold specimen surged towards Jericho, its mighty jaws snapping shut mere inches from his leg. She screamed to Jericho, her voice shrill with terror. Thankfully, Jericho heeded her warning, scrambling back towards the safety of the beach, his face pale and his body trembling from the close call. With their supplies hastily packed and their nerves frayed, the group set off towards the narrow path that led back to their vehicle. Their footsteps hurried, and their eyes scanning the water's edge for any sign of the prowling sharks. The path wound along the coastline, hugging the rocky cliffs and offering little protection from the encroaching tide. As they rounded a particularly treacherous bend, Miguel's foot caught on a loose rock, sending him tumbling towards the water's edge. A black-tipped shark materialized from the depths in a heartbeat, its mighty jaws clamping down on Miguel's outstretched leg. 
The sickening crunch of bone echoed across the cove as the shark thrashed violently, dragging the screaming Miguel deeper into the water. The others watched in horror, frozen in place by the gruesome scene unfolding before them. Liam finally sprang into action, grabbing a nearby branch and charging towards the shark, his face contorted with rage and determination. The shark, momentarily startled by the commotion, released its grip on Miguel's mangled leg, allowing Liam and Jericho to drag their injured friend back to safety. Isabel and Samantha quickly fashioned a makeshift tourniquet, their hands trembling as they worked to stem the blood flow. Miguel's face was ashen, his eyes glazed with pain and shock. They had to get out of with their voices barely above a whisper. The group pressed on, their pace slowed by Miguel's injury but fueled by a renewed sense of urgency. The path seemed to stretch endlessly before them, each twist and turn revealing more treacherous terrain and the ever-present threat of the sharks lurking in the shallows. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they caught sight of their pickup truck, miraculously untouched amidst the chaos. With renewed determination they hurried towards the vehicle, their shoes slapping against the sand as they ran. Liam fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking as he unlocked the doors and ushered the others inside. Miguel's ragged breathing filled the cabin as Samantha and Isabel tended to his wounds, their faces etched with worry. As the truck roared to life, Liam gunned the engine, the tires kicking up a plume of sand as they hurtled down the narrow path toward the main road. Sensing the commotion, the shark surged towards the retreating vehicle, their sleek bodies cutting through the water with terrifying speed. Jericho watched in horror as one particularly tenacious black-tip shark leaped from the water, its mighty jaws snapping shut mere inches from the rear window. Liam's knuckles turned white as he gripped the steering wheel, his foot flooring the accelerator. The truck lurched forward, careening around sharp bends and leaving the sharks in their wake. It wasn't until they reached the main coastal road that the group breathed a sigh of relief. Miguel's condition, however, remained critical and they knew they needed to get him to a hospital as soon as possible. In the weeks and months that followed, the scars of their encounter would heal, but the memories would linger forever. Miguel, his leg permanently disfigured by the shark's vicious attack, found solace in the unwavering support of his friends. Later, the group remained inseparable, their bond forged in the crucible of their shared experience. They became advocates for responsible ecotourism, sharing their cautionary tales with others and promoting a greater understanding of the delicate balance between humans and the natural world. As the sun lay below the horizon, painting the sky in brilliant hues of orange and red, the group looked back on their harrowing ordeal with a newfound respect for nature's power and unpredictability. What had begun as a peaceful camping trip had quickly descended into a nightmarish struggle for survival against the very creatures they had come to admire. In 2013, the remote Isla del Coco, a national park located approximately 300 miles off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, served as a protected marine sanctuary teeming with abundant sea life, including multiple species of sharks thriving in its temperate waters. The remote, uninhabited islands had been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to their incredible biodiversity and efforts to protect the endangered Galapagos, white-tip reef and whale sharks that congregated there. A group of American tourists had booked an eco-tour to snorkel and scuba dive amid the vibrant coral reefs surrounding Isla del Coco. Among them was Calvin Davenport, a high school science teacher passionate about marine biology. On the second day of their excursion, the tourists were enjoying the warm waters in a relatively shallow inlet, enthralled by the schools of colorful fish darting between the swaying kelp fronds. But their tranquility was shattered when a deckhand on the dive boat began frantically waving and shouting for them to return to the ship immediately. Jeffrey Takata, the seasoned park ranger accompanying the tour, felt his blood run cold when the reason for the alarm became clear. Cloudy trails of blood roiling up from the reef below. In a blind panic, the snorkelers thrashed towards the ladder, hauling themselves over the gunnels, but one tourist was not so fortunate. As the boat's crew pulled the last straggler, Claire O'Malley, onto the dive platform, they gasped in horror. Where her right leg had been was nothing but a frothing stump of torn flesh and protruding bone. An abnormally large great white shark, well over 15 feet long, had ambushed the woman, 
shearing off her limb with a catastrophic chomp before disappearing into the depths, potentially to counterattack. Thanks to the quick efforts of Calvin, who happened to be an experienced EMT, Claire was stabilized long enough to evacuate via helicopter to a hospital on the mainland. However, she would remain in intensive care, having lost over half her blood from the traumatic amputation. Jeffrey and the Park Service closed off part of the waters around Isla del Coco, as the massive rogue shark remained unaccounted for, potentially still lurking in the vicinity. They brought in Socorro Castillo, a renowned ichthyologist, to try and unravel the mystery behind the Great White's extremely uncharacteristic hunting behavior. Great Whites were present in moderate numbers in the marine sanctuary, but they rarely ventured into the shallow reef areas to hunt, preferring to cruise the deeper ocean outskirts, and an attack of such sizable proportions on a human was virtually unheard of, especially without being provoked. As Socorro analyzed environmental data collected by the research staff, a potential pattern emerged. Detectable levels of toxic runoff from agriculture and manufacturing on the mainland had appeared in the currents, particularly in the area where the attack occurred. She theorized that pollution and human activity may have driven the shark into a confused frenzy, causing it to view the swimmers as prey, rather than avoiding them as typical great white behavior dictates. If her hypothesis was correct, the great white could strike again at any moment, putting any human activity in the waters at extreme risk. Socorro urged Jeffrey and the rangers to evacuate personnel from the sanctuary until the rogue shark could be located and neutralized. However, the park warden bristled at the idea of closing off the sanctuary and interrupting their vital conservation and research operations for a prolonged period. He contended they had enough security measures to mitigate the risk while safely conducting their work. The tension came to a head when the rogue Great White savagely killed a park ranger conducting underwater surveys. Jolted by this latest fatality, Jeffrey authorized a full-scale hunt to eradicate the threat once and for all, looking to Socorro for guidance. She warned eliminating the Great White would be daunting and futile if the core issues of contamination and human disturbance weren't addressed. But she realized Jeffrey's duty was protecting human life. Stealing themselves, the pair embarked on an unorthodox hunt, using every tactic to interact with the predator in its territory. After several close calls, they realized the only solution was capturing the Great White alive and relocating it to an isolated sanctuary away from humans. Though immensely challenging, it was a chance to preserve the fragile balance between species and humble humanity's role in the undersea realm. With persistence and daring, they eventually succeeded, restoring safety to the marine paradise through their courageous actions. In the aftermath, strict environmental regulations were enacted to curtail toxic runoff near the marine sanctuary. Jeffrey and Socorro's harrowing ordeal also fostered greater awareness of the need to respect the natural habitats of apex predators like great whites. The sanctuary flourished as an ecological wonder, a powerful reminder of the importance of conservation and coexistence with nature's most awe-inspiring creatures.